Hey gang, my name is James White and welcome to the Signal Noise Broadcast. As illustrators, we rarely get the opportunity to not only document the process of working with a client, but then actually be able to show it. In today's video, we're going to do exactly that. I'm going to walk through Illustrator and Photoshop to show all the processes involved in creating the cover art for Runaways, the newest album by the mighty synthwave act Wolf Club. I'm psyched to show this, let's get to it. Before I started this build, I sent two sketches over to Wolf Club, and I'm not going to show those sketches until later on in the video because I want to reveal what this artwork will be as I build it. But those sketches were derived from conversation and mood board images that the guy sent over to me, which is a great jump point for ideas and references that we want to nail down in the final piece. I'm not one to use mood boards in my process, but if you're developing art that's going to be representing an album, it's always good to get some imagery from the musicians to see what they might have been looking at when they were writing the themes for the album that you're going to be developing art for. That's really important. I normally develop inline sketches when I'm developing pieces like this, and that's what I'm doing with the Lamborghini. What I'm trying to do is rough in the general shape and color of what that car is, just so I can get it into the vector form at this point to make sure that the concept is still holding together. It's just information that will save me some time later on if it's not working. Here's that final Lamborghini asset. I developed this off camera because, in short, I suck at drawing cars. So I needed some heavy photo referencing for this. The photo obviously belongs to somebody else, and I didn't want to include it in this video. I apologize for skipping this step, but here's the Lamborghini. So now we're going to jump over to Photoshop. I'm not going to bore you with watching me copy and paste all my elements from one program to the other, so if you want to know what elements are there, you can see them over in the Layers palette. They all should be labeled. One of the tricks I started doing in the last few years is adding a flood layer to the very top of my layers palette. In this I'm using some gross purple and I'm setting the blending mode to screen and dropping the opacity down to 15 or 20 percent. What this does is adds a little bit of purple to all of the colors that are going to appear in this illustration and it's a little trick to normalize everything, to bring that spectrum a little bit closer together so no color looks wildly out of place. You're going to see me jump back and forth between Photoshop and Illustrator quite a bit in this video. What I'm doing is I'm editing my smart objects, adding and removing elements so I can get certain effects applied to certain areas. In this case, I'm removing the hubcaps from the Lamborghini and I'm pasting them as their own smart object. That way I can add an effect just to those little blue rims without affecting the rest of the Lamborghini. I mentioned in a previous video that I use a lot of clipping masks in my work. You can see those over in the layers palette represented by those little arrows. I use those to quickly add lighting and texture and effects to elements that are below them. Typically those are the vector elements. So if you haven't experimented with clipping masks and layer masks in tandem with one another, I'd highly recommend checking those things out. Really, really powerful. Just a side note, you might see my colors get a little desaturated from time to time in this video. That's because my Cintiq was being grumpy, it was messing with my colors every now and then. It might be an HDMI cable issue or something, but just stick with it, the colors will come back. One of the themes of this video is going to be overthinking. The pillars are a good example of that, where I'm going to make a number of attempts to do the shading and the highlighting, the texture and the detail work, when ultimately it doesn't need that heavy of a hand. All of the elements in this piece are kind of set back from where the viewer should be. So there's not a lot of detail needed, you just need to convey the proper information that those things are structured, they're concrete, and they're textured. We'll get there though. So in this one I'm going to go into my archive and grab a cloud texture and place into the background, set it to overlay, adjust the opacity just to give the impression that there are clouds back there. All of these elements are made in Illustrator and Photoshop. They're all digitally made, so you have to be really careful about adding photographic elements in there because you don't want this to look like some kind of a weird mixed media collage thing. You're going to see me using a lot of the same techniques in my videos because this is a creative process that I've developed for myself over the course of about 10 years. In my early career, I believe that Illustrator is used for logos and Photoshop is used for photograph manipulation and effects and things. I didn't realize that there was a middle ground between the two that you can adequately combine the strengths of both of those programs. 
So developing assets in Illustrator allows me the power of its precision, but bringing those assets into Photoshop allows me to add the texture and the lighting to really bring the piece to life. So what I'm doing right here is I'm adding little faint edge lines to that Lamborghini. Now those lines aren't gonna be really visible in the final product, but it's going to bring a little bit more life into that Lamborghini to make it look a little bit more structured, a little bit more 3D, and a little bit more effective. So the more time that you spend with your elements along the way, the more effective the illustration is gonna be as a final result. I've mentioned it in previous videos, the power of setting your gradients to dissolve. Adding noise to those gradients and breaking up that otherwise smooth algorithm, if you do it consistently and with a light touch, your entire piece will have a really nice texture and it'll look more handmade as opposed to being made on a sterile computer, which is what we're doing. We're just trying to fake analog, man. <laughs> okay, heads up, gang. I suck at this style of lettering. <laughs> Here I am in Illustrator, goofing around with points and curves, trying to capture what a handwritten title would look like. I've tried this style many times over the years, and I've sucked at every single one of them. So I'm going to place this into the artwork in temporary format because it captures the vibe that I want, but it is nowhere near final. I got a little bit of help with this, and we got it fixed up, and it looks way better later on. Sometimes you just gotta ask for help. One of the concepts that I sent over to the Wolf Club guys had a slice out of the sun to make it look like the Lamborghini was zooming across this bridge. They were really into that idea because it added a lot of movement, so I'm going to make a few attempts at trying to capture that motion. Adding movement to these kinds of illustration is really important. Vectors tend to be very sterile and very heavy and look very static, so if you can do anything through effects in Photoshop to make things look like they're moving, it's definitely worth exploring. Here I'm trying to add a little bit of interest into that ocean in the background, and I went into Illustrator, used that blend tool with a thick to thin line, set it about eight steps or something, and bringing that element into Photoshop, setting it to overlay, and then trying to make it look like it's waves or a reflection of the sun in the background. That will ultimately change by the final piece, but some things work and some things don't. You gotta give it a shot to see what happens. Here's a signal noise alert, gang. Drawing cities and buildings is really, really difficult. <laughs> I've drawn these damn things in a lot of my pieces over the years, and they look different every single time because I cannot figure out the right way of illustrating a city. I would love to have a process somehow where I can generate a cool looking city, even if it's just buildings in their simplest form, so I can bring those assets into Illustrator and recreate them in this style. Maybe I should get my pal Mike Winkleman on the phone and ask him how he does it. Yo, people! How do you generate cool cities, man? Hit me up! So what I'm trying to do is also extrude those buildings to make them look like they're three-dimensional objects. So before, I just had those flat rectangles. Now I'm trying to add little edges onto those buildings to indicate that there might be a side panel where the sun might be hitting and lighting it up. Just to give it a little bit more interest and a little bit more structure. Cityscapes are another element that I tend to overthink all the time. When you see buildings from a distance, you can't really see the finer details. What I have to do is try to figure out a way to have a lighter touch with those buildings in the background while still conveying the information that I want them to convey. We're going to touch on some of those as I continue. As I go, I'm going to be bouncing back and forth to get those vector assets to look like there's a little bit more interest in them. So adding different levels and different floors, taking chunks out of those rectangles to make it look like there's different parts of the same building.
given that our illustration takes place at dusk, I want those windows to be lit up in those buildings. But figuring out a way to not overthink those windows, but adding enough of an illumination to make it look like that city is lived in was a really delicate balance. So first I tried to do it with a brush tool and just put in like blobs that are bigger and smaller than one another and try to make them random. But it looked a little bit too messy and it didn't convey what I wanted it to convey. The second attempt was to go into Illustrator and use the blend tool to essentially make a grid of windows. So I got those into Photoshop, started duplicating the layers, and immediately it looked too structured. It looked way too fake. They're too big also. But it just looked like there's not enough randomness in there. It, it looks more like a air conditioner than it does a building. So even though I put a couple of colors on there, ended up deleting it. So I do what I typically do when something isn't going right. I move on to something else. <laughs> Adding little roof lights and antenna lights to the tops of those buildings is a great way to make a city look like it's alive. At least it's one step in doing so. I'm not putting too much time into these lights. I just got the circle tool. And I'm just placing them in so they have a little bit of variation to them. Some are slightly larger than others just to make it look like the city is more alive and there's more energy happening in there. We'll deal with those damn windows later. Building an illustration this way can get really complicated really fast when you have a number of elements all at work that you're developing at the same time. So what I try to do is build inline lists as I go. And I normally do this at the beginning of the day. I'll sit down with the illustration to see where I am in the process, and then I'll make a list of the things that I want to accomplish, say, that morning. And that list might be figure out windows, sort out sun, and add texture to bridge. And it could be as simple as that, just so I have actionable items that I can pursue in this to keep a little bit of order to my process. Here is window attempt number three. I went into Illustrator, made some lines, got those elements into Photoshop, adjusted them. Now I'm going to add a layer mask to those and using just a simple brush tool, start notching out some gaps in those lines. This is going to allow me to have control over the height of each individual window, but also that randomness that I need to convey the idea that there's people in those buildings. They're either working there or they're living there. And taking chunks out of those things takes a little bit of time, but ultimately it adds the randomness and the amount of detail that I was looking for. This is more ditch digging, like I mentioned in a previous video. It's a small task that's not hard to do, but it's just over and over again as you chase a desired effect. So painting in these little notches, this is like meditation to me. And ultimately, the longer we spend with it, the better it's gonna look. So taking out entire floors of windows too, like maybe that's one giant office and all those people are off for the day, who knows? But it just adds a little bit more energy and a little bit more life to those buildings. So it took me a few attempts to figure out this was the execution needed to do this, but ultimately we got there. And hey, I'm not above duplicating an asset after I made it to use it somewhere else in the illustration. So I'll make an entire group of windows, paint in all the gaps and stuff, and I'll just duplicate it and use it in a different side of the building. I'll flip it and, you know, randomize it as much as I can so hopefully nobody notices. It's a time-saving device, right? So I went in for a second round with these windows and added some color to certain areas because I wanted some of the windows to look like, you know, the curtains were closed or the lighting is a bit different. Again, it's another little device to make it look like there's people in those buildings, you know? There's a little bit more energy happening in there, like it's, a, it's an active city. So that was a simple little technique that just worked. My work ethic definitely comes from my parents. When I was a kid, my family had an above ground pool. And that damn thing got dirty every single day because we lived on a dirt road. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was my job to clean that pool. So every day I would go out there against my will to vacuum that pool, which took about an hour or two every single time. But what I discovered was if I moved the vacuum really quick, I could kick up the dirt from the bottom of the pool so the pool looked clean for about an hour, and then the dirt settled and it looked dirty again. And my parents caught on to what I was doing. But they taught me, if you took your time, if you applied yourself, and you move the vacuum slowly, you can actually suck up the dirt so it'll stay clean for the rest of the day. That work ethic from cleaning that damn pool every day is something I apply to my illustration as well. Don't leave anything in the realm of just good enough. You should always do your best and take your time. 
So as you can see at this point, I've figured out those windows. I applied that task to everything. It took quite a while to get them all in there, but the windows are finally looking the way that I want them to look. Let's talk about depth of field for a second. Depth of field is the illusion of things going back in space, and this technique has been around for as long as art has existed. And what I try to do in my pieces is add smoke or haze or fog to certain elements to make it look like they're further away. So if you're ever in a place where you have a great view and you can see for a couple of miles or whatever, look at the things that are off in the distance. They're a little bit more faded than the things that are close to you. There are a few buildings in this illustration that are supposed to be closer to the viewer than the ones in the background. So I tried to give that illusion by making these arched windows a little bit more rendered, a little bit more realized, just to give the impression that they might be closer in the field. And also putting them lower, making them look like they might be part of an older city with that flat roof and those arched windows. At this point, the Lamborghini looked a little bit static, despite us adding those zoom lines in behind. So I thought adding a cool fade effect to those hubcaps might add a little bit more motion and a little bit more energy into that area. Really make it look like that Lamborghini's in motion. This is the third album cover that I've had the honor to design for Wolf Club, and each one features this Countach. It's been really fun and a unique opportunity to revisit the same elements throughout a series of album covers to try to weave a little bit of a narrative and maybe a little bit of story into the artwork. That's been really fun. I mentioned earlier that I prefer to use a combination of Illustrator and Photoshop in my illustrations and a big reason for that is because I've always had a problem drawing directly into Photoshop. Drawing is my first love. I always have a sketchbook on the go, but when it comes to digital illustration, drawing, whether it's with a Cintiq or an iPad or whatever, I always feel a disconnect with the piece because I want a certain level of cleanliness that I just, I'm not good enough with a Cintiq or an iPad to achieve that in Photoshop. So using Illustrator to get that precision down, that allows me to keep my illustrations really clean and really organized the way that I want them. Adding palm trees immediately gives an illustration that synthwave vibe, so it was always our intent to add some palms into the lower part of this illustration. I didn't create these things from scratch. These are pre-made assets that I bought from some damn company 10 years ago, like iStock Photo or Dreams Time or something, and they've come in super, super handy. And if you look back at a lot of my pieces and a lot of my posters that have palm trees, you'll see these same assets being used over and over again. If you have an asset that looks great and it works properly, why bother illustrating another one from scratch, right? Now I've used the Broken Sun on a number of illustrations I've done throughout the years that have a very orderly line effect, but the ones I was doing for Wolf Club had this really fun digital glitch breakup to it, which is really fun to do and it's really easy to achieve this effect in Photoshop as long as you don't overdo it and you try to keep your lines as orderly as possible. But it instantly adds a little bit of motion to the background and to give the impression that that Lamborghini is speeding across that bridge. With all my illustrations, I try to do all I can to break up an otherwise flat asset or a flat gradient. So I went back into my archives and I pulled out a cool cloud photo and overlaid it over that gradient in the background just to break up those colors and add some nice variation. Like I said earlier, you have to be really careful about using photographs in your work. You have to use them as subtly as possible so the style doesn't clash. I added some neon signage to the city buildings just to make that city again look like it's lived in and also just because they look cool. I did that off camera because I pulled those assets from a previous client job that I worked on a number of years ago. I don't think the assets were actually used in the final product for that job, but I thought it might feel a little bit disrespectful to bring another client's work up in this YouTube video. So I did that off camera. Sorry about that. 
in all honesty, I was putting off doing those pillars this entire time. They were on my list for the duration of this illustration, mostly because they're just the least exciting part of this. Like, everything else was so much fun to work on, but these pillars, like, ah, concrete slabs, fine. I'll just get it done. <laughs> The bridge was never really sitting right with me because it just looked like a bar that went across the center of the illustration. So going in with my brush and just freehanding in some little cracks, giving them a little bit of shadow to make them pop out a little bit, was just enough information to convey that that bridge is made of concrete, that it's made of stone and that it's been there for a little while. Little details like that can go a long way. And of course, my go-to when I want something to look cool and I don't want to put too much thought into it, add some LEDs. <laughs> so we're going to do the same thing, add some pink and orange lights onto that bridge, a little bit more life and energy, and as I said in past videos, adding LEDs just looks cool. That's their only function. Maybe it'll deter helicopters from flying into the bridge or something, who knows. Safety first, right? I really should make these LED assets a part of my global library or whatever it's called. I use the damn things in every illustration and I have to create them from scratch every time. Could probably save a few minutes if I pre-made those things. So I've moved into the polish stage of the illustration where I'm looking at all these elements again to make sure everything is separated properly from the things that might land behind it. If the sun is hitting the side of those buildings, what might that look like? Can I add a little bit more interest in there, or a little bit more color, or a little bit more detail? So I'm just fine-tuning everything at this point to make sure everything is the way that I want it to be. My wife Naomi mentioned that she really likes that little ghosted building that's at the bottom, so I grabbed the rectangle tool and I added a few more of those little ghosted rectangles, just to give the impression that there's other buildings below the bridge down there. Makes it look like it's more of a full city. And here's the final. As you can see, that final Runaways title is in place now. I commissioned Forces Creative to develop that, and he absolutely killed it. I've been a fan of Forces for a number of years, and frankly, he's the best in the industry at doing that 80s handwritten treatment. Big shout out to Forces Creative. I also dropped in a proper profile for the driver of the Lamborghini. Before, I just had a circle in there, and it looked like a Lego figure or something, so had to give him a proper treatment. I also added a little bit of detail to those palms at the bottom. Just went in with a clipping mask and a normal brush and painted in some of those highlights just to give those palm trees a little bit more life than just a standard silhouette. So there we go. I realized after putting this video together that I never showed the original sketches that I sent to the Wolf Club guys. So. Here they are, the magic of editing. I gotta send a massive thank you to New Retro Wave and Wolf Club for allowing me to document this process to show everyone. If you liked what you've heard during the process video, all that music is by Wolf Club, so be sure to drop by their Bandcamp. You can find the link right below this video. You won't be disappointed. So thank you very much for dropping by, gang. If you want to show some support for this channel, you can just like, subscribe, tell a friend. You can drop by the Signal Noise store to see what merch I might have available. I also set up a Signal Noise Patreon, if that's your thing, and I want to send a big shout-out to everyone that jumped on the Patreon since I set it up. I really do appreciate it. My name is James White, and this is the Signal Noise Broadcast. Stay rad. Stay rad.